Hello again, friends, and welcome to Madison Bookbeat, your listener-sponsored community radio home for Madison authors, topics, book events, and publishers. I'm your host, Stu Levitan. Our guest this hour is National Book Award winner Sarah M. Broom, author of The Yellow House, just out in a new paperback edition from Grove Atlantic. Her new virtual book tour starts tomorrow night at 7 in a crowdcast conversation presented by our friends at the Wisconsin Book Festival. Ellis Marsalis of Blessed Memory and his eldest son Branford at the WWOZ Piano Night of April 2019 asking the musical question, do you know what it means to miss New Orleans? But what does it mean to be from New Orleans? Indeed, what does it mean to be from anywhere? And what does it mean when the place you're from no longer exists? In 1961, a 19-year-old New Orleanian widow named Ivory Sule Webb, eight months pregnant with her third child, bought a Camelback shotgun house at 4121 Wilson Avenue in the sprawling new development known as New Orleans East, seven miles but a world away from the fabled French Quarter. Ivory May and her second husband, Simon Broom, moved in with their blended family in 1964 and had some kids of their own. They named the twelfth and final child, born in the final hours of 1979, Sarah Monique. The house eventually acquired new yellow siding, but inside was never finished and in constant disrepair, especially after Simon died just six months after Sarah was born. The house survived Hurricane Betsy in 1965, but would not last long after the water of Katrina and the federal flood 40 years later. What that house meant to one family and what its loss means to the entire country is the business that occupies Sarah M. Broom in her extraordinary debut, The Yellow House. Part narrative nonfiction, part memoir, it is also a profound meditation on race, place, and class. Published to enthusiastic, almost ecstatic acclaim last summer, it has enjoyed many printings and garnered Sarah the aforementioned National Book Award for Nonfiction and the John Leonard Prize from the National Book Critics Circle. Sarah M. Broom received her undergraduate degree in anthropology and mass communications from the University of North Texas and a master's degree in journalism from UC Berkeley. She's been a newspaper and magazine journalist from Rhode Island to Hong Kong an editor at the Oprah Magazine, has taught nonfiction at Columbia University, worked for the mayor of New Orleans and a radio station in Burundi, and is executive director of the global nonprofit Village Health Works. She is married to the film director Dee Reese, with homes in Harlem and the Marigny neighborhood of New Orleans. It is a pleasure and a privilege to welcome to Madison Bookbeat National Book Award winner Sarah M. Broom. Hi. Hi. I'm so happy, so to, happy to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Do you ever get tired of hearing that phrase, National Book Award winner Sarah M. Broom? Never. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm still in a state of disbelief about it. Well, I so enjoyed this book. It was, it was a great read. It was a well-deserved award. Thank you for writing it. And congratulations on the paperback edition and starting a new book tour. We are happy you are starting it in Madison with our friends at the Book Festival, and I'm honored to be able to kick off the tour here on Madison Bookbeat. I'm so thankful for this. Well, what does it mean to come from New Orleans, to belong to a place with so many mythologies? Well, you know, New Orleans is just one of those cities that I think you know, for people who have been there and for people who haven't, there's something so compelling about it, something that maybe is a feeling more than a fact, right? And I wanted to really think about what it meant to come from, from a place that was outside of 
the stories and the narratives that the city tells itself. Um, and I thought there could be no better way than to begin to interrogate the city by thinking about this particular house and my particular family and our vantage point as, as human beings growing up in this fabled place, yet being outside of it, right? I, I was so intrigued and still am by what that vantage point allowed us. Is there some kind of some kind of psychic cost when people define themselves in terms of where they come from? I think so. And I think I, I think there's a cost for all of us who do that, right? Because part of what happens, I think, is that because the place comes to stand in for you, you lose your sharpness when it comes to critiquing the place and really turning its dysfunctions over. And, you know, there's this wonderful line that James Baldwin said, you know, he said, you know, I, I critique America precisely because I love it, right? And that's how I feel. So yes, I think the psychic cost is that you, you, the place comes to stand in for you. You, you, and, and it makes it impossible for you to get un, from under the place, so to speak, right? In order to truly see it and to interrogate it and to ask the very human questions that have to do with all the things we inherit, some good and some very bad. Let's talk about the place. The night you received the book award last fall, you quoted your late brother, Simon Broom Jr. telling you, you grew up on Wilson Avenue in the East, baby. You can handle anything. What did it mean to grow up in that house on soft ground on the short end of that long street, cut off by highways and bounded by water in New Orleans East? Well, you know, the the feeling I instantly get just hearing you ask the question is of pure unadulterated joy. Just like we were little wild kids in the middle of New Orleans, barefoot and wandering and running. And, you know, unlike the kids who maybe were in the city and their houses were close together, you know, there was a lot of land. Um, so, so there was a lot of joy on this short end of a long street where I grew up. But one of the things that I was so intrigued by and that I was able to piece together as I got older were the ways in which we as children were so connected to the earth. There were things we understood without even understanding. You know, when we, uh, for instance, there were days where we couldn't play hide and go seek or kickball or soccer or whatever we had come up with because it was raining. And when it rained on our street and in much of New Orleans East and, and now in much of the city, right? It, the, the water would stay for days, right? So we intuitively understood, hey, there's something wrong with this picture, right? We shouldn't have a swamp in our yard every time it rains. And so our way of negotiating this uh, real, this environmental issue was to logicalize it by saying, oh, this is quicksand. We live on quicksand. And we'd come up with stories about it, you know, hey, you better not run over there because then the ground will eat you. You know, you will disappear. You know, the ground, we would say the ground ate our ball, right? We, we came up with a kind of way to think about this very wet and moist world, which is an unforgettable thing for me. Ironically, you were connected to the earth and the ground, but you were separated from the rest of the city and by extension, the rest of the world. Did, is that what gave you that initial motivation to go out and, and find out, investigate and write about other blank spaces? Well, you know, I when I was a child, I think it, for me, it was all very natural. This was just my world and the world I understood. and. But I think as I got older and became a writer, uh, I, I started to understand that this world that I came from, this vantage point, the fact that we were cut off in so many ways 
actually made me the person I am now. I think I always had a wandering spirit. I always wanted to know things. Maybe I get that from my mother, particularly. Um, but I think it, it made me this sort of person who thought, okay, whatever that story is they're telling you, there's something else to it. Go find out what it is. When you started the research for this book and went to read books about New Orleans East, how long did it take before you realized that you actually had to write the book that you wanted to read? Pretty instantly, pretty instantly. Um, because A, it just did, it, 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 and it was more basic than that. Um, in order to do, let's say, the research to find out the history of the French Quarter apartment where I eventually lived, it took me, you know, I just typed in the address and I got the entire history going back to the 1700s. For the Yellow House, where I came from in New Orleans East, you know, I was consulting primary sources. There was no database. Nothing had been collated and compiled. And that made me think so much about which places deserve compilation, which places deserve uh, an attendance to history, and according to whom, right? According to whom. So it was so transparent to me that New Orleans East and many other communities, right? Um, the, the attention wasn't being paid as a kind of statement about the, the value of the place. And I thought, I certainly grew up in a place. We all thought we are from a very important place. All of us who were on the short end of Wilson Avenue feel like we came from a very real place. And so my job was to bring this world alive that I knew was part of what was your audience when you were thinking about that your nieces and nephews and and other young children who may grow up on wilson avenue and grow up in the east to understand w where it is they come they come from yeah i think so and you know for my own family now you know you look at the book and it just seems like this these stories that all make sense but when I was reporting the book, I was gathering just fragments and pieces. So I wanted to make a history for the children in my family. You know, we didn't have, my partner had a grandmother who gathered, you know, all of the information and in the family history and just made a little pamphlet for everyone to have. And so I imagined this that way, you know, that I would somehow collate pay close attention to the history of our family, their movements through time, the houses they were in, their sensibility, the formation of the interior self, and then compile it. And, and maybe it could be a kind of beginning, right? A tip of the iceberg with, with so much more to be written and to be said. In, in finding out those stories, you did hundreds of hours of interviews and oral history with your family. How did that change your understanding and relationships among your many siblings and, and your mom? Well, you know, Stu, it was really difficult. And it's even difficult for me to remember now because uh, first it was just super labor intensive. And, uh -huh. and beyond that, I'm the baby of these people and I am somehow out getting out of line and asking them these sort of questions that are difficult and painful. And, you know, I'm also using what I know as a journalist and trying to push a little bit, but I realized very quickly that that had too many limitations. And so I, became more of a participant observer, as we call it in anthropology, and did less a kind of journalistic thing with my family and more of an ethnographic thing. So, so because it required that work of being with them. So I would have a little tape recorder so that they would know in their minds, you know, I'm recording. 
but it's uncomfortable because if we're like, let's say we're just having fun and we're going to a barbecue together, I'm recording. I'm recording every detail of our life together over the course of a year. And that's in addition to pointed and specific interviews because I'm trying to capture the sound of them, the detail, how they say things, right? Um, and, and I think there were points where some of my siblings, my brother Michael said to me, hey, are we hanging out or are you working? I mean, what what's going on, you know? And there were moments where I was, my siblings had forgotten about the recorder. And, and I just, I felt a little bad because I felt in those moments that they were telling me things in a certain way only because they had forgotten about it about the fact that I was recording them and this could become something. Were there things that because of those circumstances you then didn't write about or, or excise from the narrative? Yes, there are so many things. I So many of the things that are in the book that I think of as very difficult things, particularly with my brother Daryl and his, his drug addiction, I later went back and said, hey, you told me these things and I just need to triple confirm that this is okay for me to talk about and to use. Um, and and I, so I'd get people's permission and often people would say, you know, I, I, I just can't. And I thought a lot about, you know, is there information that could hurt someone who's alive? Is there something that could set them back, right? And, and then I just make the, the decision uh, that it, it, I actually don't need this. There are so many other things, compelling ways to tell this story and to add a layer of difficulty for me in order to spare this person might be the way to go, right? Because I have to tell the story because I'm dealing with facts. You know, I can't just make it up. It's all the truth. And so I think I made a challenge for my own self, which is that, you know, don't sacrifice these people you love to death, but 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 also don't, um, you're, this is not hagiography. Hey this is not hagiography. Hey this has to be real. The, the, the concept, nothing but the truth and the whole truth are different <laughs> concepts. <laughs> and and, and you, need, you need to know which, which side of the, the, the oh. field you're playing on. Um, you talk about being around with your tape recorder, like a little Andy Warhol or something, but you've always been the tape recorder of the family, even from when but, you were a little child. Was that because you were the babiest of the group and, and felt it your duty or, or your responsibility to document their lives? I just always found them and I think people very intriguing. I'm very intrigued by human beings and I'm an observer, I think. I like to watch and I really like how people put sentences together. In my family, I, I just find them to be some of the more interesting talkers, you know, how they form the sentence, the things they say. Um, and, and this was from a very young age because my mother has always been a really good storyteller. My mother, dis she, she loses respect for you when your storytelling skills are weak, you know? And, and then you have to remember there are 12 human <laughs> beings and they're often all talking at the same time. And so you're in the middle of this fantastic world and so I would hide, I would go and I would hide in the closet or I would hide under the table or wherever people were telling these fantastic stories and just memorize every single thing they said. And then I would run off and like tell the person they were talking about, it literally just repeat it back to them, you know, like a tape recorder. So that's how I gained that name. Yeah. I was going to get to the point of, of the shout out you gave your mother that night you won the award and talk about the impact she had on your love of words and language and reading. Oh, well, my mother, um, you know, one of the strongest memories I have of her is us being on the bus together, going someplace. And, you know, you walk on the bus, she has all these kids 
and she's just like grabbing the pamphlet from the back of the bus. There's like a pamphlet with all the routes and a story about the regional transit authority. And while we're riding the bus, my mother is like reading this. I just remember her being obsessed with knowledge really was what it was. She wanted to know things as she would say. And, um, and, and we were readers kind of studious in our house. You know, I remember taking Spanish classes and coming home and my mother saying, what did you learn today? Teach it to me. And so like really growing up with this woman who loved language and, you know, she was a reciter of the Bible in our church. You know, she would get up, there are pictures of her at the podium sort of reading scriptures. And I just remember so much writing her words, you know, every word she said. And I think she liked the kind of pomposity of the language, depending on the version we were reading, the King James or the, you know, but she sort of, I think, reveled in language, really. Um, and I think she, if she had not had a zillion children, I think that she literally would have been a poet. We're talking with Sarah M. Broom, her National Book Award-winning uh, memoir, The Yellow House, is now out in paperback. Sarah will be at the Wisconsin Book Festival tomorrow evening, but we get the chance to talk to her first. Uh, you give a very evocative description of your father, Simon. He was the kind of man who always had another place where he urgently needed to be. <laughs> How much of the motivation for writing this book was your desire to learn about a father whom you essentially never knew? Well, so much of it, Stu, because um, for me, much of this book is about absences. It's about the powerful presence of absence and um, the way in which the idea of a person and the history of a person lingers in your psychic space and also in your physical space. And so my father having been quite literally a ghost to me, you know, um, a few stories that people told, a few photographs that people told. I just wanted to make the discovery of him um, part of the journey to discover the story of the house, which, which involved him so thoroughly. And I wanted that story somehow to also be the journey of discovering the city itself and the ways in which my own father was so much a part of it, right? Um, and you know that, I think that the story of my father, I never fully, I, I wasn't able to fully explore in this book because I think the dead ends were devastating to me. And I found many distractions, you know, so in low of my father, for instance, I spent months researching my mother's father, who's buried in the city in St. Louis Cemetery, number one. And I was off on a four month tangent, just learning everything about this guy who was my grandpa, who I never knew. And then I was just like, what? wait, you're supposed to be figuring out who Simon Broom was. So I do actually feel that that is the part of the book, which is perhaps least explored. How much of the pain of losing the yellow house was because it broke a connection with your father? I think so much of it. But I didn't know that until I was on the sixth or seventh draft of the book. How so? I I think there's something about the 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 rigor of revision. For me, when I revise, which is all, you know, writing is revision. Writing is revision. Um, that is the moment when I'm making connections, when I'm solving big problems in the work. And there is a kind of devotional mind that I cultivate in those times. That mind is 
a, a, a mind in love with solitude, a kind of internal quiet and depth. And and in one of those moments, I, I thought, yes, I'm writing about this house. My father did this and that and that. But then I realized, oh, my God, this grand obsession you have, this feeling that it collapsed is not in that collapse. That is not indistinct from this great loss, this great sudden absence, right? The grief of that. Um, I, you know, with my father, I could have felt perhaps, Stu, that I didn't just fall out of the sky. Surely someone brought me here. Who was this person? And I think I didn't feel that differently with the house. I thought, surely there was some place that grew me. I didn't just fall out of the sky, right? And that was ultimately the story of the house and the story of my father. Let's talk about the house. Uh, your mother appreciates beauty and nice touches, but she was essentially overwhelmed by the house, especially after your father died. By the time you were a teen, her mantra was, this house not all that comfortable for other people. Yeah. How did everybody handle the fact that you couldn't have friends over, you couldn't entertain, you couldn't have sleepovers? Well, it was actually really hard, particularly for me and my older sister, Lynette, who's five years older than I am, because we were both at the age where, you know, it was our turn to have a slumber party. It was our turn to invite people over. And it created a situation where we were children hiding a house, which is a sort of impossibility. I mean, we would go to just any, by all means necessary, to make sure no one saw this house of ours. And that just created a real tension and real feelings of shame. And I think, you know, what I say in the book, and I believe it so deeply, was that, you know, we were going against our natures, that, that we were essentially people who loved entertaining, people who loved bringing people in. And, and by not doing that, by making so many assumptions about what people might think about our house, we, we went against our natures. And we know that going against our own nature, right, is an internal terror. Well, by writing the book and bringing us into the house, are you going against your mother's nature and, and bringing us in where she thought we would not be comfortable? You know, no. I think that what I ultimately was attempting to do was to, by sort of giving a kind of context and building out this world, what I mean to say is so many of these things were never my mother's fault. So much of this was literally built into the structure of things that for lots of people in America, this is how it works. Sure, you can scrabble and get a house, right? Which percentage of, of which people get to keep their house? To have a house over time, you need to maintain it. If the ground is soft, if you have subsidence, if you know you shouldn't actually be building there in the first place, right? These are, these are things that existed long before my mother in certain ways. And so I think part of it too was, was placing it in context and saying, you know, we were one of many, many families living in this area, living in this neighborhood, and we should not have taken on this shame as our own. And in addition to that, a house can't speak for you or stand in for you. A house is not all of you, <laughs> you know? What, what what are your lasting thoughts on the house? You, you, on one hand, you're, it's unfinished, it's disappointing, you, you can't bring over friends, it doesn't keep you warm, it doesn't comfort you, but it seems you love what it represented. Yes, I think the, the representation of 
independence and freedom that it meant for my mother that, you know, she was 19 years old and owning her first house, which stood for something. And, you know, when my mother was owning her first house, my grandmother, who also was a house obsessive, loved houses and rooms, didn't own a house yet. You know, it would take her many more years to get that house. So it was a really big deal for my mother to sort of be in this position of homeowner and sort of ruler of her small kingdom. You started taking notes for the book as soon as you went away to college in in Texas. You obviously couldn't account for Katrina years beforehand, but what book were you writing up until August of 2005? So up until August 2005, I was writing a book about architecture and space. And, you know, the uh, the literal physical construction of Louisiana houses and thinking about Haiti and how Haitian houses were somehow connected. I was writing about the dilapidation of the physical house, the yellow house. I was writing my memories within the house. Um, but it was very focused on the street, the ground, the land, you know, the house itself. You know, I was really writing this Um, kind of if the walls could talk type thing, everything I remembered. You know, when Katrina happened, the book completely uh, transfigured, maybe is the word, because I wanted to complicate it in so many new ways. But then beyond that, just as a writer, I was now talking about absence and, you know, then I come alive, you know, when I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> the thing. So that I understood all these things, you know. You were living and working in New York in 2005. Did you have something akin to survivor guilt from not being there during the storm, especially when you learned what Carl and some of your family members had gone through? Yes, Absolutely. And, um, and and I'm actually proud that I was able to talk about this a little bit in the book, about that feeling I had that, you know, while they were going through this thing, I had somehow escaped in advance of them. And the, the guilt I felt afterwards when people would say to me, you know, hey, were you there for Katrina? And I'd say, no, but my siblings were. I, you know, I'd just refill the guilt all over again. And... I think so much of my journey after the storm was a kind of really weird concentric circle where I was trying to get some feeling of what they had been through. I think that's why I literally displaced myself and moved to Burundi. I think I wanted to unseat myself in the way they had been. I mean, you know, these are the ways that our psyches work. Right. Um, And so I think in a way that was my own reaching for understanding, trying to understand something I could never understand. And to this day, will never be able to understand beyond what they tell me. Right. Um, But I think there are so many of us in that position who weren't necessarily there. And I also wanted to make a point, Stu, about how inheritance works. So in other words, I don't have to be there for the trauma. That doesn't mean the trauma isn't as real for me as it is for my siblings, right? Um, I may not have been there. I mean, now there are all these studies that show that there's intergenerational trauma, that you may not have been there for your great-grandmother's trauma, right? That doesn't mean you didn't inherit some of it. So it's it's actually quite deep. What was your first reaction when Carl told you about chopping through the attic and spending days on the roof? Um, just, you know, I, I think gratitude that he'd survived. Just the that overwhelming feeling that he he somehow made it. Right. And, you know, there was this really, really unforgettable moment that I, I, I think of actually quite often. And it was the moment when 
Carl wanted us to accompany him to the house he had escaped. And, and he essentially acted out his motions. Okay, I, this was the hole. I went in the hole. He had gone there. He had taken us there to retrieve his weed eater. That's, that's what he told us. But when we got there, we realized it was like a play. So the house is in front of us, and we're all staring up at this roof. And, and my long-legged brother Carl is, like, doing all these movements, and he's going in the hole, and he's coming out, and he's showing us, you know, where the bucket was and where the dogs were. And we're all just in this circle watching him, you know. And it was just so profound, that moment where you realize you know, this almost feels like a dream that he made it, that he survived, you know. Yeah, you know, those of us watching from afar, I don't think we ever figured, okay, what happens when the TV camera goes off and that guy is still on the roof? It's, yeah. it's, I mean, it's not, it's not in front of us. We don't see it. We don't, we don't accept that it's happening. The circumstances of the Yellow House being torn down are heartbreaking and almost Kafka-esque. If you had been there to see the Yellow House demolished, what do you think would have been going through your mind? Well, I imagine that it's it sort of, I feel in some deep way that I long for, even still, the ritual of being there to watch. And I think the job would have been to witness, to note, to be in that present moment, to feel, to smell, to um, record, record, record. It's, it's that moment. I mean, what's so interesting about this book and what I discovered as I was working in it, Stu, is that there are all these deaths that happen in the course of the book. And, and we can't compare misery. So some deaths were <laughs> different, but they were many deaths. And that demolishing of the house with no one there was also was a tragic death, right? Of the place we knew. And so I think it's not dissimilar from the feeling I perhaps have with my father in that, and then later I have a relationship that ends similarly, right? Where the person just disappears. <laughs> and I realized that if I were there, that that would have given me some, I, I think I would have been able to have some connection to the place that was quite different from what I ended up having, you know, which was this feeling that it was so layered. The disappearance of the house became so layered with the dysfunction of the city. And it took me a really long time to unravel those tentacles. Is there, is there anything liberating from the house being gone or is it a constant weight that it's gone? No, I think now it's completely liberating. Having written the book, it's, it's, it's sort of, I've made it make sense. Right in the act of writing, um, and I I feel unleashed from it. Um, it's sort of like you know, it's a piece of furniture that resides somewhere inside of me, you know. But I'm not. I don't have this this feeling necessarily of something having been incompleted, you know, or that something is unfinished, I guess. You've, you've done what you needed to do for this yeah, part of the story. I yeah. understand it. We're coming on the 15th anniversary of Katrina. The size of your family is relatively rare, but the narrative you experienced of dispersion and displacement and municipal disappointment was routine. What is the lasting legacy of Katrina for New Orleans and by extension for America? Well, I think Katrina did something really important, which was that it revealed this underbelly of America, actually. And all those people who were stranded in the city, who were stranded on roofs, who were stranded in the Superdome, who lost their homes, who were essentially 
buried while alive, right? That was, we now know, a symptom of all the things we see exploding now, right? This idea that some people are more valuable than others, that we take some people's lives more seriously than we take others, that the system is broken, that there are environmental challenges we've just been ignoring, that we're not working on a plan to fix. And and I think that now when you think back on it, right, it it you really can see the ways in which it was a kind of foreshadowing. Um, and that's also why in the book, I spend so much time talking about Hurricane Betsy, which happened in 1965, because I'm, which is exactly 40 years before Katrina, because I'm trying to make a point about patterns, about history, about the revolving nature of history, that if something doesn't get resolved, here it will come again. It's going to come again and again and again, as long as it's unresolved. And I think thinking of Katrina and thinking of this moment now and thinking of Betsy are evidence of that. After you, after you became an adult and went off and did various interesting things, you came back and lived in the quarter at a, for a year at a very famous uh, corner of St. Peter and Royal Streets. How did that affect your perception of New Orleans and your self-perception of yourself as a New Orleanian? Well, it was so interesting to live there because it was the most exciting place. I mean, there was no inside on that corner. You know, when you went to sleep at night, you were part of the jazz band playing down below. It was just like Disney World, New Orleans. You know, people were walking the streets at all hours of the night. You know, it was just raucous and, you know, even for me, somebody who had at that point, before that point, lived in New York for a lot of my life, you know, you could actually walk around the French Quarter and go to the store and to the gym. You know, it's a sort of walkable life. And but the thing that, you know, immediately is that care is taken in this neighborhood. You know, the streets are cleaned. You know, we need to take care because this is the ideal. This is our presentation of self to the world. And, and, and you start to realize what investment means and particularly me, because my siblings are calling me from New Orleans East and saying things like, you know, there's smoke instead of sun in the sky. The marshes are burning. You know, a dead man was dropped off in front of my house last night. And, and, you know, meanwhile, I'm sitting on the porch, uh, you know, singing I'll Fly Away. So it's sort of like that, that moment of the kind of, you know, that would sort of jolt you out of this revelry so that you could say, what is the distance between this place where I live now and the place I come from? What, what has it cost me, perhaps? to be in this new place? What, it, what did I leave? What do I still need? You know, um, why am I leaving every single day to find my brother Carl in New Orleans East, right? What, what is that? What's, what's I, I really love, I think, as a thinking person to think about a line and the space between the two points in the line, because I think there is so much to be understood you know, in that space between here I am now in the French Quarter and here's my brother calling about smoke instead of sun in the sky. One of the things you left behind was your first name, was your name. When, when you were a young child, up until your first day of kindergarten, you were Monique. And then the first day of kindergarten, your mother says, identify yourself as Sarah, because those people will relate to you better as Sarah. How did that bifurcation of identity affect you as a child and as you grew up? Oh my God. It, 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 you know, I think already having been a black kid in America, I, there was this sort of bifurcation, but that really made it plain as day because what, what happened then where there were the people who knew which name to call 
for closeness to me. And then there were the people who didn't, who were outside of that. And my mother, you know, because she had been born in 1941 and had figured this all out, understood that Monique would allow too many assumptions about who I was, that it might, it might slow me down somehow. And that Sarah was a name that didn't really reveal anything that you could maybe still have a chance because, you know, your resume would roll across the table. They go, oh, it's Sarah. And then I'd show up and they'd be like, oh, you know, but it's sort of like my mother, but she created, I think, a kind of ease within me moving between these worlds, right? So like people would call my house from school and my brother Carl, you know, he'd answer the phone, hello. They'd say, could I speak to Sarah? He'd literally say, with no joking, you have the wrong number. There is no Sarah here. So it just created a completely double self that to this day exists for me. But eventually, wouldn't he? Wouldn't Carl start to call you Sarah? He, he did, which is interesting because it, it had so much meaning. It was rich with meaning when he did because I thought, oh, this means distance. This means... You know, he's saying it, he claims to be saying it as a joke, but he is getting at some tension inside of me having to do with our relationship, right? And maybe how it is changing over time. For a memoir, there are a couple of major plot points that you deal with in a very offhand almost cursory fashion. Getting your master's at Berkeley and getting the gig with Oprah, are that's big news, but you pass them off almost parenthetically. Why did you take that approach to those big plot points in your own life? Because they weren't relevant to the story I was telling. I, you know, had mapped this out really closely and I was writing for a long time, I was telling myself that I was writing an autobiography of a house. And every story in the book has some very apparent relationship to that structure and that spot. And I, you know, I, I didn't want to sort of write a navel gazing, oh, Berkeley was wonderful, and oh, I loved working at a... It's just not my style. I was trying to complicate the idea of, of autobiography, of memoir, by saying, what if this is like a Bearden-esque attempt to take all of these patches of things and make something? Right. And so I just felt and I'm also this is going to sound like the weirdest thing imaginable for me to say, but I'm also a little I'm actually quite private and shy about those things. I just couldn't imagine going on and on about some thing I had done. Well, well then, I, I hope this next question is neither awkward nor unwelcome, but since you did sort of refer in in the text to a failed uh, relationship with a man. You, you, you d d d d pretty far into the book, you talk about a, a terrible breakup with a man that you yeah. assumed you're going to marry and, and how heartbreaking that was. You have since gotten married to the film director DeAndrea Ernesto Reese, known as D. Did the reflection that you went through in writing the book have anything to do with your falling in love with her? Well, maybe indirectly, because I met her at the McDowell Colony and we were both working. And, you know, I feel that when I'm working seriously and earnestly, that I am a frozen block. It just feels like a moment where it's impossible for me to let someone in, especially new per a new person, right? And, but we sort of fell in love at McDowell because I was transcribing at the time um, because I transcribed the large majority of these interviews and because I wanted to hear these people in my head. And I remembered, you know, Dee being around and, and me transcribing Carl and taking out the earplugs and letting her listen and sort of like sharing in this sort of 
beginning of this creation, right? Um, and I think there is something very special about this moment where you're collating all the pieces and and you have this sort of, I think there was some part of me which as frozen as I maybe generally am, was completely seeing in this moment, right? And I think that, and I, I just fell in love in that way because I was so observant, paying so much attention. We were paying so much attention, not only to our work, but also to each other in the context of our work. You know, so I think it was indirectly somehow related. That's a nice, <laughs> nice byproduct. We've, we've got about two minutes left. Uh, I want to ask you about a current event that just happened. Uh, McDonough was the patron saint, uh, a wealthy slave owner was the patron saint of public schools in New Orleans. Your aunt Elaine went went to, I think, McDonough 36. They threw him in the river the other right. day. Your, your, your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's great, you know, um, and I, I am just, I'm really intrigued by you know, who we are obsessed with retaining the monuments of. And I feel that, you know, this is part of what's happening now. The activists are out there. They're making these statements. And I think that, frankly, this is long overdue. I'm really tired of America's monuments and statues, these sort of calcified um, things that do not advance us. And I think if we're ever going to have a reckoning, we can't care about a monument to, you know, um, <laughs> I, I think, I just think we cannot care about a calcified monument. We need to be engaging right now with the people who are moving and breathing and trying to stay alive so that we become a better America. Finally, you're going to, the, the next to last night on your virtual book tour is back at the University of North Texas. What does the Sarah M. Broom, uh, the 40-year-old Sarah M. Broom, tell her 20-year-old self uh, when she's sitting back there in her dorm room? I think slow down, slow down. You can slow down. I, I, I was such a rogue. Okay. Well, I'm afraid that is all the time we have. My thanks to Sarah Monique Broom. Again, the book is The Yellow House. You can register for her Crowdcast conversation tomorrow night with Lisa Lucas at wisconsinbookfestival.org. Next week on Madison Book Beat, a conversation with UW professor Stephen Wright about his debut novel, The Coyotes of Carthage. For now, on behalf of News and Public Affairs Director Sholly Pittman and all of us here at Madison Bookbeat, I'm Stu Levitan. Thank you for listening. And now, as Ben Sidron plays us out with a bit of Little Sherry, please stay tuned for Alex Wilding White and All Around Jazz. You are listening to WORT 89.9 FM, Madison, listener sponsored community radio. <laughs> The WORT well, Board of Directors. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thanks, Live Steve. Team you, at 7 you, PM, you virtually on book, Meet. Inside and out. Meet Thank you. The well, I, I figured you went through a lot to write it. I should, I should give it a close reading. And I, I, I don't know if I don't know if, if Kate told you. I even found a typo. Surgeon radio kiosk from Monday, July 18th. In that chapter when you talk about interior.